and then we'll roll audio if you're ready. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. In three, two, one. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of Everything Valuable and Beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. I did a lecture with Northern Trust and a wonderful woman, Kelly M. Anderson, who's an attorney and a tax nerd, self-described tax nerd. And uh, we had a ball. And I said, Kelly, I want you to come on the program because the kind of stuff we talked about, uh, Richard, it's really valuable for anybody um, of any income level. Uh, and so what I want to just give a, a quick pricey shout out. We're going to talk a little bit this hour about your finances in regards to two, two, two topics. The contents of your estate in, in art and antiques and collectibles, that's an important part. We're going to talk about how to think about those things as assets. What kind of assets are they? How you plan for those assets? And we're going to talk about how appraising and valuing fits into that whole picture. Elizabeth, let me throw one yeah. thing in there, if I might. Sure. What if someone like, such as myself, who is not a conscious collector of any of those elements, may have inadvertently throughout his or her lifetime, actually, accidentally or otherwise, managed to acquire some of these elements that you've described? Uh, oh, that's a really that's good another, question. So, that's another so aspect let's, of it, I think. Let, so that's a good question for Kelly. We're going to ask Ke Kelly in a, in a minute. But what I'm, what I, oh, in fact, we'll ask Kelly now. Um, so now I'm going to put the question differently. So Kelly, you, you know, you have a trust. Let's say uh, there's a couple. They, they have a trust, and and um, both pass, and. Um, Someone like me comes in and it's a type of appraisal, Richard, that we do for an estate administration. Mm -hmm. It's called a 706. And Kelly would order me to do the, this procedure uh, where, where I'm doing the valuation for the estate because the heirs now are going to inherit uh, surreptitiously anyway. Um, so Kelly says, OK, Elizabeth, go in and do an appraisal. Uh, think of it in terms of a 706. It's a certain type of, of format. And uh, I discovered there's something that mom always thought she got it at, at, at an estate sale, Kelly. Mom always thought it was a Picasso it, a print. It had nothing to do. It was a lithograph. And, uh, you know, it was, it was not of any value at all. And I discovered it's one of his um, editions of Jacqueline, which is one of his wives. And he only made seven in that edition. And it is a screen print. Once I take it out of the glass, I can see that it is a, it is a screen print and it is um, signed on the back, which is very untypical of Picasso, but it, nevertheless, it is signed and it is also numbered in the edition. So let's say it's three out of seven. Now, Richard's uh, the heir in this case. And I say, well, look, you know, your mom uh, inadvertently, as Richard said, picked up a, a, a Picasso. How do you how do you look at that, Kelly? Now let's just say that that Sotheby's the last Jacqueline they sold was ninety six thousand. Okay, so how do how do we explain that to Richard? Well, that's um, it, that's a that's a very interesting question, and it happens, right? Um, we see often that um, when when mom and dad pass, or or when somebody passes, and the beneficiaries um, who may not have full um, insight or knowledge into all of the assets that were in the estate or that are coming to the beneficiary. Um, so they're kind of coming in a little bit blind. So this is not an uncommon situation, Richard, that, that you that you describe. And um, in fact, um, that's one of the things that we did talk about, Elizabeth and I at our lecture, um, was was this this opportunity to pre-plan. Um, every, you know, I always my my catchphrase is planning is a verb. It's always, it's an ongoing process. Um, it never stops. You might have a, a will or a trust in place, um, but that's, that doesn't end the process right there. It's, um, it's an ongoing, as things change, as life changes, asset changes, you, you, you keep up, you continue to update, you continue to look at it. And, and one of the steps is in, in planning is having an inventory 
of what your assets are, and perhaps even sharing that with your beneficiaries um, so that they're in a better position to know what they're what they're going to receive. Um, so, so that's you know that's kind of what we talked about, and I think we're gonna we're gonna be able to use this show to um, um, you know to, to explore that idea a little bit more. But let's say like in your situation, Richard, you didn't know. Um, you just, it just happened upon you. Um, and, and that, that's where it becomes important that now you are that person, Richard, that, um, the burden unfortunately is going to be placed on you, unfortunately, or unfortunately is going to be placed on you. You now need to be the one, uh, to start engaging in the planning. You have this valuable asset. Um, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to, um, protect it? Um, are you going to keep it? Are you going to look to, to liquidate it? Is it something that you're going to want to, um, uh, turn into your family's legacy or, or create as part of your family's legacy to be passed on to generation generation. So for you, that becomes a, hey, let's have a conversation or broader conversation with your advisors, your attorney, uh, with Dr. Stewart, who's doing your appraisal of what do I have and what are my options for it? And if I'm gonna, if I'm going to liquidate it, here are the options for that. If I'm going to keep it, um, do I put it in trust? Um, where am I going to, you know, who, who's, who, who am I going to, who am I going to manage it for? Um, where am I going to store it? How am I going to insure it? Um, those are the type of questions that were, that your advisors would go through with you um, so that you can start your pre-planning and planning process right from the get-go and prepare your beneficiaries for, 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 for prepare yourself and prepare your beneficiaries for, you know, so they're not in the same situation that you found yourself in. So let, let me just ask a little further, because Richard, I, I, I want to take your question a little further with Kelly. So let's say Richard needs that 96,000. And uh, I'll, I'll just give you, you know, the, the indication. We know that mom bought it in, in an estate sale. And let's say uh, <laughs> for the what we're going to talk about is capital gains, Richard. But anyway, so let's say mom is it, she bought it for $20 and Richard mm -hmm. needs that 96 uh, K. On the other hand, um, the second part of that question would be uh, he'd like to sell it. And um, there, let's let's just make it easy. There's no other heirs. Um, and so so how so how would you advise? What would you how, what would be the parameters around which you talk to Richard? Um, well, um, I would first make sure that um, Dr. Stewart, you or somebody's around who can um, speak towards the art market and um, how to go through that process. Um, I, you know, I personally have never been through a sale in, in the public markets or at auction and that, you know, that comes with its own, um, you know, advisory metrics. What are the costs for that? What's the timeline looking for? Um, you know, Richard, your liquidity needs, is it immediate? Is it long term? Um, are we going to be able to, to meet or match your expectations for when you're going to receive the cash and how much you're going to receive uh, after costs? Um, is there going to be a tax element? It sounds like it won't be in, this, in, these, in these limited sets of facts um, because this came to you uh, from a death. Um, and by virtue of Dr. Stewart doing the 706 appraisal, um, you're going to receive a step up in basis, which means that... Um, it's going to be equal to the fair market value. So when you sell it, there will be no um, or small or no gain. Um, but nevertheless, if there's a long time that goes through and there's an event and, and you know the, the a piece of artwork appreciates greatly, maybe we do have to have a tax discussion with you about how how that might impact you. But those are the kinds of things that I you know that we would be talking about is is timeline. Um, your expectations on timeline, your expectations on the amount of money that you receive, and your expectations on on the process, the commitment and the process to um, you know to to go into the art market and and sell it. So, Richard, what Kelly is talking about in my, in my language, okay? So you've inherited this Picasso. It's ninety six thousand, and Kelly would say, okay, Elizabeth, we need you to do an analysis of what that market looks like because. Richard doesn't want to take a loss on this because Richard, we said Richard needs the money now. So if he needs the money now, how desperate does he need the money? In other words, are we going to sell when the Picasso market has shown that it's kind of like plateauing? Or is Kelly going to say, look, Elizabeth, we need you to find that. I mean, R Richard really needs the, the last dime. So we really need you to find the market in which the chances of Richard getting all that 96 thou is really high. But then if Richard, you say to me, well, look, Elizabeth, I, if it's 86,000, it doesn't matter. I have a debt I need to pay. Mm. 
so now we say, well, okay, is the, you know, we're going to take a risk here. We're going to uh, sell in a market that's a little wavery. Um, and, and what you would be doing with someone like Kelly would be to take a look at that whole picture. You know, okay, it's a wavery market. And here's the debt we have to pay. Is it worth it to pay the interest on the debt, say, for example, and keep that and, and look at the market that's going up for Picasso? So we're we're planning on on when to sell and how to sell. And Kelly mentioned that oh, she's going to say, hey, Elizabeth, are we going to sell privately? Or are we going to sell at auction? Are you Richard? Did you want to sell at auction? Do you want to sell privately? And what what do you think would be the difference? Um. If the market is is good for the Picasso, I'd probably go to auction. I think I might get more at an auction with people bidding, those who would be interested. Yeah, there's the com competition angle. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. But there's also the commission angle. Oh. So um, so it, at auction, at, if, if it's over $100,000 takeaway, mm -hmm. you know, they their commission is pretty darn low. It can be like five to eight percent that they're, you're, oh, that's all you're paying out of what you what the proceeds are if you sell uh, for privately and it's a down market and the gallery is saying eh, you know we're not all that happy with um with selling for you anyway and it's a lot of time and the market's not so good they sometimes they'll take 50 percent ouch yeah but if you're desperate for that money and they've got a buyer that they can go to tomorrow at auctions, you, it'll take a good three to six months for a property of that value to come up to, uh, to the block. I need to, I need to make a payment on this stadium behind me. Yeah, exactly. If you need to settle that debt, you might say, look, it's worth it to me. I need 40 yeah. grand and I'm going to go with the gallery because they'll liquidate it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what, we, what, what, what Kelly is saying is, and why why we thought we'd do this hour, by the way, she and I, is is there's a whole, there's a lot of moving parts involved with some with various expertise. But you need somebody like Kelly at the helm of the ship so that Kelly can say, okay, now we're gonna get, we're gonna order an appraisal. Now we're gonna look at the whole package. Now we're gonna look at um you selling at a gallery versus an auction, that Picasso. And then what we're gonna talk about when we get back from the break, Kelly's gonna say to me or say to you, Richard, about your Picasso, you know, what if we did something different with that debt? And what would it look like if you donated that work? And uh, what, you know, what what would it look like if you, you felt really strongly about um, the Santa Barbara Art Museum and you really wanted to donate that work? What would that look like? And what kind of what kind of yeah? What what kind of effort would it take? What kind of risk would would it take? And how much would that hurt vis a vis the debt you have? Yeah. yeah. So you know, we let's talk about that very quickly because there there's always when Kelly and I were brainstorming about talking about about this topic. Mm -hmm. There's the where to sell, how to sell, who to sell with, and then do you sell at all? Do you retain? Mm -hmm. How do you decide to retain? Or do you say, I really would like to donate? How do you decide to donate? So when we get back, and it's really interesting that there's someone like Kelly in our community because I have worked with a lot of different planners, financial planners, and I was so impressed with Kelly because what she's doing is she's thinking along the whole line. She's not just saying, yeah, okay, here's the debt. Let's take 96 grand and let's sell and blah, blah, blah. And that's it. And it, she's thinking through things, mm -hmm. which is really quite rare. And she's what she's trying to do is think, is is say, what would be in your best interest? You know, okay, what would it look like? Also, if you had if you predeceased Amrita, um, what would that look like in terms of Amrita um, um, inheriting a property now? Let's say with the art market increasing, it's one hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk, we'll talk quickly about that when we get back from the break. And you, you know what I didn't do? I didn't ask Kelly to introduce herself. So when we get back from the break, we're going to start start with Kelly and, and doing her really interesting background. Um, and, and, and she is in the community, by the way. She's here in Santa Barbara. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute. Okay. Go ahead, Elizabeth. You know, and it's interesting, too, that she takes it down this path. Go ahead, Elizabeth, if you want to get a cup of tea. Yeah, I was just going to get coffee. Oh, okay. 
um, I just turned 63 yesterday and I had already applied for my social security benefits. And obviously people are telling me, well, but wait a minute, your, your full benefits age isn't until what, 67 or 70 or something. I said, yes, but I really need the funds now. Well, yeah, but you're going to get penalized because you're working. And I said, yes, I know that. And what I found out was what my benefit will be for five months out of the year. I would rather get the five months out of the year benefits now than have to wait another uh, three to five to maybe seven years before I can before I collect anything, uh, because uh, it, it would be beneficial right now. So this whole conversation as far as assets, for example, I have in, encased in a piece of uh, a plastic case, <clears throat> a 1964 Kennedy silver dollar. Now, I got this back when I was probably a teenager from some company that I I don't know if I ordered it or it was a gift or something. I don't know if it has any value just because it's a 64 mm -hmm. Kennedy and it might be, for, you know, solid silver, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'd have to have that appraised by, you know, by Elizabeth. But I, you know, it's like I would literally have to go through all of my personal belongings just to see if I have <laughs> any assets. Anyway, let's go ahead and pick it up. You'll have her introduce herself and so forth and continue on in okay. three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm speaking with Kelly M. Anderson, who's a financial expert with Northern Trust here in town. And Kelly, please introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Yes, um, and thank you. Uh, well, we just got like right into the conversation. It was so interesting. So, um, you know, that's that's what happens. And, and that's kind of what my job is. I'm my technical job title is wealth advisor. Um, and I, I'm at Northern Trust um, and I sit in the uh, Montecito office uh, for Northern Trust. And as a wealth advisor, I'm very fortunate that I just all day get to talk and have conversations and discussions with with families um, about their estate plan, their wealth plan their goals, their objectives, um, what are they trying to accomplish? I mean, we address questions like, you know, how much will my kids receive and when will they receive it? Do I owe a state tax? How do I plan for assets on my balance sheet, such as art? Um, are my charitable provisions still appropriate? The, the, the topics that we talk about are, are just as diverse as, as what the definition or, of artwork is. Um, and, and so every day is, is a, new, um, a new adventure and a new ways to, to strategize around um, exactly how you said, Dr. Dr. Stewart. There's many different goals and, and intentions that are always at play. There are many different assets at play. Um, what's the best way or what are the various options um, to, to achieve those goals and objectives in you know, your current and your overall, your long-term estate and wealth plan? So some of the things that you know come to mind, you know, that 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 perhaps if I would say, okay, you know, you're going to a client of mine, you're going to be speaking with a, a wealth a, a wealth manager such as Kelly. What kind of questions would you ask around your art? Um, what 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 would Kelly need to know to help you kind of make a decision about what you want to do with the art. So, I mean, a quick checklist might might look like this. It might be, what's the purpose of this meeting? Um, mm -hmm. Are we going to talk about um, airship issues, estate issues? Are we going to talk about sales, selling objects before you 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 leave the planet? Are we going to talk about donation? How how does that mm -hmm. all fit together? Mm -hmm. And then um, things that, that, you know, you might want to think about um, to come prepared to talk with a wealth manager such as Kelly. You might think about when was the art purchased or when did you inherit it? I mean, Kelly, I think I told you I did this um, appraisal of a uh, large collection that was going to a museum from a, someone here in town. And they... The, the heir, for some reason, could not find and did not know dad's accountant, had no real connection with dad, could not locate the 706, had no idea. That's the 706 is that form that says this is what things are valued when you leave the planet. So it was important that we, that we have a, a date of death valuation for his dad, but we didn't. 
and yet he wanted to donate the entire collection to a museum that he had inherited. How, and so we were kind of thinking, well, what, how do we figure that one out? Because there's no, there's no date of, there's no valuation. You know, we don't know what he's donating. So it would be, when was the art purchased or inherited? Mm -hmm. What has it been owned for more than a year? That's an important thing to think about. Has it been, has the art been owned for more than a year? The other thing that Kelly needs to know and um, might be a really good thing to, to find out before you meet with your financial planner, what's the condition of the artwork? Because if you, um, if you and Kelly decide, look, you're going to donate the artwork, one of the big important things that the IRS looks at, because of course you're taking a donation so you can take that against your, your taxes. But the IRS has a big column on this form which goes along with the appraisal for donation. What's the condition? Um, and you know they they want to see the they want to know the condition. They they actually have asked me for conservators' report or uh, some of the more expensive works of art. Um, you know because there's all, been all these tax law cases, Kelly, where they're like, okay, taxpayer, here's a nice photo, but it doesn't show the big hole at the bottom. It's been doctored up, you know, which devalues the piece tremendously. And so, you know, condition, who's, what conservator do you know, what restorer do you know, who will be receiving the work if they're, if you're donating, that makes a difference too. You want to mm -hmm. be careful about, so you want to talk to Kelly about these things. Um, you want to ask her, what's the, what would, what are, what will it cost me to retain the work in, as far as insurance? Because she needs to know um, that, A, she needs to know that things are insured if, if they're over a certain value, but B, she needs to know um, the relative value of, of, of something that's going to be insured because it's a different valuation that we're using. So we're yeah. using uh, replacement value and we're not using fair market value like we would in an estate administration proceeding. Anyway, Kelly, before we go to quick, quick break, please tell me about your background. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, um, you know, as the wealth advisor, those are the, the types of conversations I have. And, and, and to my background, I am um, an attorney and accountant by background. And I spent my um, career prior to joining uh, Wealth Management Northern Trust, um, practicing law and preparing tax returns, including some of those 706 returns, um, the estate tax returns. So uh, I'm well familiar with um, some of the uh, the arguments and and um, taking on the IRS a little bit uh, in in my previous in my previous job. So it's a good point to bring up and. Um, you know, I, I, just to comment real quickly, I know before we have to go to break, but just to comment real quickly on, on and summarize what you just brought up, Dr. Stewart, which was a lot of information. Um, when, you, when you talk to a, a wealth advisor or a financial advisor, you know, we're going to be looking at cash flow because let's face it, cash flow is, is the most important question for many, many families. And it's, do I have enough uh, for me, for my lifetime? And then after that, what is left over that I could benefit others, where it's a charity or my or my heirs? So that's where our conversation is going to come around. And art is just one of many assets that we talk about when we're trying to figure out: um, Do I have enough and of my excess? Um, you know, what what are my options for my excess? And 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 those are those are the ways that we those are the directions that we take we take the conversation, not just for art but for any assets. So uh, I think we can go more into that. Um, a little bit later. So um, I, I would love to have you talk about a question that I've always had is loaning to a museum. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of my clients ask me, what would be the advantage? You know, is there what we call fractional interest? Is there, is there, is there, uh, would my, would Kelly advise me to loan to a museum or to promise to a museum? So I have a client that they worked out with their wealth advisor that they're going to make sure the Met gets this work. And they promised the Met this work. And it's a $3 million work of art. Mm -hmm. They promised the Met they'd get this work. In the meantime, they've got, they didn't, 
want to really pay for insurance, to be honest, Kelly. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, could, 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 even though we're not ready to give you the work, we're going to loan you the work. And they showed the work, the museum, the Met showed the work. So I'd love to hear you reflect on that because I myself didn't know what to advise them on that. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to have your yeah. friend. Richard, are you there? I am here. Yes. Okay. And you know, Richard, it's really interesting. You bring up that Kennedy silver dollar mm -hmm. because there's certain coins that have appreciated astronomically. And I'd love to take a look at that coin for you. Sure. And because, you know, you, you, you may not even have to think about the social getting involved with social security two years early. If we, if we find out that coin is worth something anyway, don't turn that dial back in a minute. I'm talking this hour with Kelly M. Anderson of Northern trust. Um, a forward thinking, really interesting woman that uh, is in our community that I was super impressed. She, she, she got her teeth into, um, into the idea of art as an asset class and um, asked me to come and help uh, discuss this question about art as an asset in a, in a whole portfolio of assets. And she just knows so much that I was so impressed. I said, Kelly, you got to come on the, the air and talk about these various angles. A lot of people don't know that when they when they're amassing a collection, it's just it's the interest in their collection. They're not thinking this way at all. And then, you know, we don't want to leave it to the heirs to work out these really thorny issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and so that's why I like, Kelly, we need to talk about this uh, um, on our program. Don't turn that dial back in a second. We're going to talk about loaning to a museum and promising to a museum and what that looks like. Even if it's not a great work of art, you can still donate. And uh, we're going to use the example of a $3 million work of art, but you know, you, you might have a piece that's, a, that's an $8,000 mm -hmm. painting and you want to donate. And, and there's ways to think about that. There's ways to think about donation of, of a print that's $2,000. You know, so uh, so let's talk about that when we get back from the break. Speaking with Kelly M. Anderson of Northern Trust, attorney and about tax nerd. Love it. Don't turn that down. Hey, Richard. Yes, Elizabeth. Okay, I'm going to get that coffee now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a bunch of other uh, coins from other countries, too, that I have gathered. I have oh. a sterling... I have a sterling uh, uh, silver pound, an Irish sterling silver pound, which they don't use anymore. Yeah. Uh, that I some, yeah. I forget where I, well, I was obviously in Ireland when I picked it up, uh, but I must have gotten it as change from somebody. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of other coins as well. I think I've got a bunch of peso, uh, one or two or three pesos. I've never been to Mexico, by the way. I, I corrected. Correct that. I have, it was on a... Uh, uh, a cruise, uh, I think it was a carnival cruise that my former parents-in-law took me on with my wife and, and her siblings and their significant others. Uh, and so I went to Cabo and, you know, the, the usual places uh, along the uh, peninsula. But I've, I, it's just like, I just would collect stuff, you know? And, yeah. uh, but I was, I was never, uh, the only thing that I actively and passionately collected for about 20 years I don't anymore. We're business cards. And I don't anymore. I don't anymore because, well, obviously most people don't. I have business cards that I do hand out, but most people don't have them anymore. It's usually an image in their email or what have you. Uh, but uh, most of the business cards I've got are probably trash. I throw them in the fireplace, something like that kind of thing. Um, I think the most interesting ones I've gotten, and I think I only have one of them, was actually a metal business card pretty wild oh, all right wow. elizabeth ready was it Richard, cool? Richard, <laughs> as long as you're talking about business cards what was yeah. so interesting was um uh, i went to the uh after concert solstice after concert and uh you know there's these people that set up their booths and they're selling things of oh, interest yeah. to the mm -hmm. to the hippie crowd and this sort of thing <laughs> and um i i bought something and i I, I know this person was very interesting and I thought, you know, that I'd love, I'd love to keep in touch. And so I said, may I have your cards? Young, a young person. 
And uh, he said, uh, I don't know what that is. And I said, you know, your business card. And he said, oh, this is, you know, my information. Take a picture of it. <laughs> and everybody who was at the booth that wanted to, you know, keep in touch with him, he was showing this, you know, here's my information. Right. Take a picture. And if it's in your phone, it's different because it's it's permanent as opposed to a business card, which I thought was so interesting. It's a total flip. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. And I actually All right. a box full, a wooden, a wooden box full jammed in there of business cards. Very neatly, mind you. All right. Here we go. Wow. Three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. Great pleasure to talk with Kelly M. Anderson, who is going to be in the future my go-to person for financial advice for sure. She's with Northern Trust, and um, we got together to do a lecture a month or so ago um, for people that were interested in the in art as an asset in their uh, portfolio. And Kelly was interested in the topic because she has counseled clients in our community. It's one of those things, she, 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 I mean, she and I were talking about this. You can kind of expect it, that the certain type of families will have a kind of a really interesting and valuable collection that they may not even know is valuable. But this is a community that is devoted to creative endeavors. And so we, we thought, wow, we're really going to, you know, talk about this to and we had a huge crowd we had a lot of people that was that were really interested in talking about how art fits into their plan uh you know and, and what is the what are the distinguishing characteristics of, of of art that has appreciated was another topic that we we want to get into this hour um but my question let me put the question again kelly You've got a family, they're a wealthy family, let's say, and they've got a painting and it's been, it's fair market value is, is 3 million. It's replacement value is 4 million. They're not sure in these days where people are dropping clients in the Santa Barbara market for insurance. They're not sure they want to pay that premium. And they know the Met wants it. They know the Met's asked to have it on loan. They're not ready to give it yet. Mm -hmm. And they know when they do give it that they can take the body of the gift against their gross in that year. But they're not sure they want to do that because this isn't the right year, let's say. How do you how do you advise them? I mean, I guess my question would be, how do you know when the right year is? They do want to donate. And is there some kind of good news about loaning? Yeah, yeah and I think the question comes, you know, and the discussion with with the family who who is um, approaching this question is, um, you know, Ultimately, who will benefit? Which, if I heard from 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 you, and we would talk with the family, um, that you know, eventually, that the long term goal or the intent, the intended um, ultimate beneficiary is a charity at some point. Um, but the second question then is is when? When will they benefit? And you know, very often the conversation we have with families are, yes, we want to give this to charity, or even we want to give this to kids, but. You know, we're not ready to take those paintings down off of our walls yet, or we want to we want to be able to enjoy them during our lifetime a little bit more. We're not quite we haven't quite hit that that mark. Um, so, so that comes into play because, you know, and everything's about taxes. Yes, the tax deduction is is fantastic. And and we'll we can run the analysis. We can do some modeling to find out when is when is the best. Um, time to, to take that tax deduction. Is there a year where you're expecting a lot of income? And if that's the case from, from, some, from some, some other sale, then maybe that's the year that we again approach the question of, well, is this the year that we make that full charitable do, um, donation to get that deduction to offset the income? That becomes part of the conversation. But in the meantime, if we're not in a situation where um, the tax deduction is, is important 
or, or relevant or powerful in a particular year. And we do have that non-financial aspect of, hey, I want to keep this, these, this artwork. I, I want to continue to enjoy it. Then you do have the ability to um, look at other structures um, to, to provide you with, with some, some benefit, like you discussed that the loaning to a, to a charity. And what that does is, is provide it, we can work out a, a, a loan agreement that, you know, terms that you agree with, um, but you do kind of ship some of the expense. So it's kind of like a shared expense of the insurance, the storage, the care to this charity, who's going to be absorbing some of that uh, while they're, they're um, hanging the paintings, you get some of that charitable aspect because you are benefiting the public by allowing this painting or this artwork to be shown. And in the meantime, you still have the ability, um, whatever the, the terms with the charitable, the loan agreement to get that artwork back um, you know, at the end of the term or, or during periods of the term, something you can work out for when each of you has um, physical ownership or physical um, uh, control over, over that painting so, or that, that artwork. Uh, so it, the, loan, the loan to a museum option becomes a, a great option to talk through if, again, um, your charitably, your beneficiary is, is a charity is one of your potential beneficiaries. Um, and it, you're in a situation where now is not the right time for financial or non-financial reasons to uh, make an outright gift to charity. So is there, is there a tax benefit to loaning a piece to a museum? There, there could be. Um, there could be a tax piece because, again, you are making a public benefit. Um, but it's 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 going to be you, it, it's a bit more of a complicated discussion to bring in a, an accountant to help you with that or an attorney to help you with that because it is really going to depend on the terms of your loan agreement um, and uh -huh. the fact that it's coming back to you uh, may negate a lot of a lot of that. Um, so I wouldn't do this going into. There may be a small charitable deduction. There may be a way to work out a small charitable deduction. Um, but I would not go into this thinking I'm doing this for the charitable deduction. It's more of a I'm doing it for to alleviate some of my cash flow planning um, for like the insurance, the insurance expenses and things like that, um, or the storage expenses that that really is my primary goal on top of the fact that I'm not really interested in giving this up just yet. I so, got so it. Again, yeah, there may be a way to structure it so that you can get something, but it wouldn't be equivalent at all. Um, to the amount you could get from an outright or, or a full gift. So that's not really should not be the prime priority. Right. Okay. So, and here's my other question around that is let, okay. So we know that a loan is not going to benefit us greatly, but now we're talking about donation and we're going to have this appraised for donation purposes. Mm -hmm. Now you say, look, um, you don't really need to take the donation in this year. I was under the impression before you and I met, I was under the impression that you could take that deduction in equal increments for five years going forward against your taxes. But the way I understand now is you take what you, you take the majority in that year you donate. And it's not a matter of equal increments over five years. Am I right? Uh, can I clarify, Dr. Sweet, you're talking about making in an out, like a full gift to charity. Yeah. Okay. So you just, you've taken this painting and said, here you go, the Met, it's yours. Congratulations. Yes. Okay. So, so in that situation where you're just making an outright gift, the full deduction becomes available to you, whatever that amount is, whatever you qualify for, that it vests, it becomes available to you the year you make the deduction. Now, if you can't use the full deduction in that year, for example, maybe you don't have enough income in that year to absorb the full, you have some left over. The nice, the one nice thing, here's something where the IRS actually gives you something. They tell you, you can, you have five years to use it. So if you can't use it all this year and you have some left over, look next year. You can, if you have, if you, if you have extra income next year, you can use the rest of your charitable deduction to offset. So you, that five-year period comes in, it's not equal over five years, it's take as much as you can, as quickly as you can, and if there's left over, you have five years to use up the remainder. That's where I was wrong. I was thinking about this, that you had to sort of divide it up. If it was five mil, it was a mil a year, but no, it, it's, it, it's not that way. And it was, it was really interesting when you were talking 
um, and during our lecture about the, the, the sort of planning in that regards. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is though, we're talking about that situation of donation versus selling versus inheriting versus, mm -hmm. you know, so there's all these verses. And for example, if you're, if you're selling and there's a lot of capital gains in the piece, mm -hmm. how you think about that versus the, the other three scenarios we were just talking about that. I'd love to have your opinion on that because yeah, a lot of folks in our community they collected because they liked an artist, they like something, mm -hmm. and they're shocked when they find out, you know, what it's worth today, that they've yeah. had it for, say, 25 years, and they're absolutely yeah. shocked. And yeah. uh, they, they, that actually is depressing in some cases for them to hear because they don't know what to do with that. So I'd love to hear you talk about that a little when we get back. Hey, Richard. Yes, Elizabeth. Okay, let's go to quick break. I just reintroduce, I'm talking with Kelly M. Anderson of Northern, she's a Northern Trust Wealth Advisor. And uh, we had so much fun talking with a, a room full of interesting people um, the other night about how to think about your art as an asset and, and how, you, how you look at that in your whole portfolio and how, how an accomplished attorney and uh, I, I keep on saying this self-avowed tax nerd, how they think about a client's art. Uh, and when we get back from the break, I want to talk about how Kelly would think about a work of art in a client's portfolio that has increased greatly, let's say 200% over a period of 20 years, how she would think about that and what the, what the impact would be if they're looking and Kelly's really forward thinking, like I said, she's say, saying, what's your intent? What do you want to do? Is it a cash flow issue? Is it, is it a is it a contribution issue? Is it your heirs? You want it to stay in the family? What's your eventual goal? Let's assume that their eventual goal is to maximize the um maximize their 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 the asset portfolio and not necessarily the sale of it, turning it into cash. Not necessarily that, but what would be their most advantageous route if they had a work of art that had increased greatly over 20 years? Love to hear that. Richard, let's go to quick break. we get back from the break. This is a lot of fun for me because these are questions I've always wanted to ask. Don't turn that down. Back with Kelly M. Anderson of Northern Trust. All right, stand by just a moment. Okay, Elizabeth, you have about, you have six minutes left, six minutes left in the program. Okay. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Kelly M. Anderson of Northern Trust, who's a wealth advisor here in town. She's in the Montecito office. I put a question to her that I've always wondered about. Um, I have a work of art, let's say, and I bought it 20 some odd years ago and it has increased 200% of, over what I paid for it. And um, so I'd like to have Kelly's opinion on what, what, my, what my options would be to, and I don't need the money, but let's put another little piece of information in here. I don't need the money, but the odds of this increasing much more are not strong because let's say that Kelly's hired somebody like me to do that analysis. And it's a style that is not necessarily going to be favored because it's had its day. So let's say that that work of art has uh, we were talking about top of the market is at the top of the market now. 
So we've got that scenario, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think. How, how would you advise? Well, um, first of all, we would definitely take an overall balance sheet approach. Uh, I know we're focusing on the art here, but we want to make sure that we're looking at the overall balance sheet, everything that's on your balance sheet, all your assets to make sure that we are making the right decision. Um, one of the, you know, when you talk about selling and you're at the height of the market, so you're thinking, um, if, I, if, if I correlate this to stock, which I think a lot of um, people are familiar with, when stocks are at the high, you want to sell, right? So does that hold true in in art in the art world and and maybe it does um maybe it does and i think there are differences um in if you sell your artwork for a large gain so you bought it low and now it's at the height of the market and you're selling it there is a very unfavorable tax um, that's going to be due on that, um, and it can be a punishing tax. It's not. It's it's not at the favorable low tax rate um, that you know the, the twenty percent that we normally feel normally hear about for capital gains. Artwork is treated special because it is a special asset class. So it's going to be taxed typically in the twenty eight percent. 28% tax rate, more often than not, there are exceptions to that, of course. So that's a hefty tax sometimes uh, to absorb. Um, so we want to take that into consideration. Can you absorb it? Do you have other deductions that might ease that tax burden? For example, maybe you can sell a piece, maybe there's another piece you can donate and get a charitable deduction to help you offset some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so so that is that is a major consideration when we're talking about going to sell any type of asset, artwork and spe specifically. So then it becomes, well, let's go back to who really, who do you really want to benefit from this piece of art? Is this something that you want to give to your, ch your, your, to your children or, or creates as some kind of a family legacy to your beneficiaries? Because if that's the case, or if you have an idea in mind that you want your beneficiaries to receive this percentage of your, of your estate, maybe that artwork is a better piece to hold on to um, and to, 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 distribute to your beneficiaries as part of your estate, you know, when the time comes far in the future, hopefully, um, because by holding it until you're, you're passing, you're going to eliminate that tax burden um, through what we call the step up in basis. So that tax burden ends up being, being resolved of its own. So, so that's another consideration to, to come into play. Um, but, you know, charity, also, it is another thing that I think about when you have a highly appreciated asset um, that maybe you don't want to keep anymore. Um, you maybe you don't want to pass it on to your children. It's not going to be part of your legacy of other assets for that. Um, this might be an object that we look um, to donate to charity, um, which again is, is a tax preferential move um, and might be the better option. So it's an overall looking at everything. What other pieces do we have in play? What are your overall goals and intentions? Um, how, what are the myriad ways, the puzzle, we can, puzzle pieces we can put, to get, put together to, um, to meet those goals and intentions regarding this artwork and in context of your overall plan? I think that is a really interesting point. And it's a point that a lot of people don't think they can understand, which is if your basis is high, with limited or no appreciation, it would be a wise move to think about selling. And the opposite is true. If, you're, if your basis is low and you have great appreciation, it might be super interesting to think about donating. Um, but it, as Kelly said, what it, you kind of need somebody to steer the ship on this because what you're doing is you're looking at well, if I do this and then that has impact on this and it has an impact on that um, mm -hmm. as regards to my spreadsheet, you know. So, um, you know, these are things that are, are part of owning and curating and being a good steward mm -hmm. of a collection. Um, and a lot of people don't think about that in terms of their stewardship. Uh, how that comes down through the family is super important. Um, if that is an intention. And I like to point out to clients who that they, they don't really have anybody like Kelly to advise them. I say, look, all the great collections of the world are named with somebody's last name. It's because they did go through this advisory process. You know, the Broads, uh, the, the, the great museums of the world, even the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. it comes down to that person thinking it through, thinking they're their collection through. Kelly, thank you so much for talking with me about this. 
Thank you so much. I enjoyed this and 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 hope to hope to uh, keep keep involved with you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Definitely, we will. Thanks, Kelly. All right, we're clear. That's very so good.